So last year, as part of my research masters, I completed a study that looked at independent consultants and for-profit firms working in development cooperation. And the study focused on international consultants, those from countries like Ireland, uh, countries providing ODA, um, and these consultants paid by agencies to provide technical assistance and consulting services in recipient countries. So these consultants often operate at the very center of how aid is delivered and often in quite influential positions. So among other things, um, my study found a gap in the conversation, despite the scale of these contractors on the ground in development in general, and of course also supporting important areas like strengthening of public health systems. The study also highlighted a possible blind spot among some practitioner groups around accountability of for-profits in general working within the non-profit sector. So say, for example, if you look at a typical arrangement in development, it could involve the donor who funds the work, then the organization or the company who hires the consultants, and then the government who ultimately receives that consulting service, but are not necessarily paying for that service. So in this situation, consultants and advisors are actually acting for three different principles. So that's a tricky position for any agent. Now, in the study, I spoke to senior development professionals hiring, working with or working as consultants. And quite a few inconsistencies came out around responsibilities, accountability relationships, who consultants are accountable for, and, um, and then ultimately to whom they are accountable. So I've worked with Kate now um, before, and I'm really delighted that we could work together on this, as uh, she works at the very center of COVID response in Mozambique. And so together, we, we build on the findings from my study to map where consultants fit within an extremely complicated network of relationships as the agents of global health response. So we use the original conceptual framework from my study to do this mapping. And um, we're just gonna have a look at it briefly now. Um, before I hand over to Kate, we'll talk about COVID vaccination in Mozambique. So we just move on to the to the next slide there. So firstly, um, I mapped who the main stakeholders were, um, governments, citizens, multilaterals, and implementing agencies on the next slide. Uh, yeah, and then I, I mapped the constructs of accountability relationships that I could find across all the different fields of literature. Um, and these are visible on the next slide on the dotted lines on the map. So then I looked at each of these relationships and included them here on the framework on the next page using terms directly from the most cited literature on accountability, such as you can see here on the next slide, the mutual accountability, public accountability, all those familiar terms like regula regulation, terms of contract, etc. Then I took the empirical data from the study and I used it to plot the different types of consultant accountability relationships across the map, depending on their role and other factors like business incentives and value systems. And you can see those positions on the next slide in those orange, um, orange dots there. And so each of these positionings um, has distinct accountability implications, which is described in the study. And each of these raise critical questions around the extent to which consultants um, are accountable. So we, if we're going to discuss improving development outcomes, equity, leadership, representation, the agency concerns that have popped up through this study should be of interest to anyone who pays for funds consultants, anyone who works closely with consultants or of course the consultants themselves. So I'm going to hand over to Kate now um, to talk a little bit more about what this means in practice. Okay, so thanks Rachel. Um, so over the last 20 years or so, I've been working in public health based in Mozambique, 
And since uh, its outbreak, I've been part of the national COVID response here with a, a focus mainly on vaccination funding and, and, and programming. The framework from Rachel's study provides a really useful tool that can help map out who was actually involved in the response. And in particular, to see where consultants, and that's individual consultants as well as private companies, how they fit in among the actors and accountability rate relationships that were involved. The mapping that we did will show that consultants were positioned in influential roles in almost all the arrangements around the work, performing roles that are almost invisible unless you're actually on the inside. So firstly, I'll give a, a brief backdrop to the vaccination response in Mozambique, and then we'll go back to the mapping that uh, Rachel shared, but this time using Mozambique as the topic of analysis. Uh, next slide. Uh, compared to other African and low-income countries, Mozambique's COVID response is generally regarded as a vaccine success story. Um, however, the dynamics of accountability may not be so different. Um, we watched from afar the, the COVID mayhem in Europe and the US, and in country we launched a huge national inter and international effort to mobilize vaccines that included their delivery and monitoring. And there were multiple national and joint coordination groups, different action channels, uh, and, and, and really um, coordination and communication were actually extremely challenging. So for example, um, vaccine supplies and the funding for rolling out vaccination were completely out of sync. Um, there was also a massive influx of money for technical assistance, uh, with urgency reducing uh, visibility and coordination and oversight of all of the pieces of the jigsaw. And sometimes there was badly defined reporting, delivery and governance requirements involving donors, the government, public and profit in, um, public and non-profit implementers, private service providers, etc. Uh, with multiple agendas and incentives, often competition won over collaboration, but everybody was aiming to support the national effort. Next slide. Uh, on this slide, we've put in the main COVID actors in Mozambique uh, in the framework with Ireland on one side and Mozambique on the other, and they're linked through the multilaterals and the different dotted lines of accountability are shown as well. So, for example, in the multilaterals, we had UN agencies, Gavi, Global Fund and World Bank, all involved in COVAX collaborations. And then also the um, various national and international NGOs and nonprofits such as Nweti or Ariel and Chai. Private sector philanthropic support came through organized, uh, companies such as Vodacom, who contributed resources to uh, support the effort. And private sector service providers and consulting firms like JSI, who were paid by others to be part of the effort. So where do consultants fit into this picture? If we press the button to the next slide, we get the orange circles that again show uh, where the consultants were. If we go quickly to the next slide, we can see that through examining their roles and the examples of the roles that were played by consultants are laid out in this table, we identified different positions and accountability relationships depending on the consultant role. Mostly, these were very influential strategically and, and operationally. So if we go back to the previous slide um, and look again at the numbers that are, are on, the, on, the, on the framework, uh, if we look at number one, um, the, the examples of uh, consultants are from ACASIS, who were funded by Gavi through COVAX to track resources, vaccines, vaccinations, as well as support planning, coordination, reporting, resource mobilization. Uh, those number two, uh, examples include consultants contracted by UNICEF using COVAX funds to support vaccine logistics and uh, CDC funds were used by FGH to support planning and coordination within the ministry. Uh, circles numbered three uh, demonstrate private sector involvement in nonprofit activities. So here we have the CTA Business Association that procured and donated vaccines, for example. And circles numbered four uh, indicate independent consultants funded by Gavi to support monitoring, management and reporting of grants within the ministry, as well as examples in terms of JSI that provided donor funded services to the ministry. Moving on to the next slide, we ask why this is the, the next one, <laughs> why this is important. Um, 
So my experience in Mozambique is that um, independent consultants and for-profit consulting firm, firms continue to be used across the board by different stakeholders and for different types of intervention. They're often placed in unrecognized, unacknowledged, or even invisible positions of influence, with many assumptions made about their responsibilities, incentives, and, and which lines of, of accountability take precedence when both nonprofit and for-profit motives are involved. So if we take a step back, accountability is a recognized norm, and both development practitioners and the academic literature agree on this. Effective accountability requires clarity on what an agent is accountable for, to whom they're accountable, and how they can be held to account. And Rachel's study emphasizes the importance for all those in positions of power to be held to account. And so if we're to learn anything from what played out through that, the, the COVID response and use this to tackle the massive challenges of global health equity, which it amplified, the role of private sector consultants and accountability implications really can't be left out of the conversation. So first, recognizing the involvement of consultants can bring them meaningfully into the debate. And while they continue to be key players across our collective action, we really must ensure that we have practical mechanisms in place to more effectively hold them to account. And thank you very much. That's finished. <laughs>